Welcome to the World Financial Symposium Spotlight Series, today focusing on health care. World Symposiums is a national organization dedicated to educating technology leaders and a series to provide a forum on timely topics in the software and technology industry. I'm Nargis, president of the Quorum Group, the leading global mid-market M&A firm focused on software and technology. We're proud to be partnering with the WFS to webcast. Shared uh, WFS events in London, New York, San Francisco. Uh, it really is a fantastic organization, and we'll have some more information on upcoming events shortly. But today's agenda, we have a great panel, including a broad diversity of perspectives on the healthcare technology space. I look forward to introducing them to you shortly. I'd like to make a couple of opening comments, though, and then look at the specific trends in mergers and acquisitions in the healthcare IT market. We're talking about a highly disrupted market, a lot of change, and where there's change, there's opportunity. Where there's risk quo, there's predictable returns. Opportunity is bringing a lot of attention to the market, a lot of smart entrepreneurs, a lot of investors, and a few visionaries who've proven their, their, their vision in the past and driven our panel selection today. So let's talk about change. First, regulatory change. This is especially true in America, responsible for 40% of the world's health care spending, and where an Obama's health care law is starting to go into effect. More change. Second, there's technological change. The disruptive technology trends like mobile, big data, cloud, and others that are impacting all industries generally. But it also includes technology like the incredible leaps in genomics. I know Reese Jones will be talking about later. Other developments unique to healthcare. So when we talk about technological change, uh, just later, we're talking about medical devices and specific technologies, but we're all talking about the incredible power of big data and of having visibility across millions of individuals, their health history, being able to draw conclusions from all of that. And that's only starting with the beginning of that. So again, more on that later from Reese. And third, and what's most important, is change. Some of this is an echo of the broader technological change and its market penetration. As consumers of healthcare, that's all of us, it's the same ease of use, rapid communication, on demand information that we get in other aspects of our lives. On Amazon.com, we find those socks that we've been looking for and we order them. We're done in minutes. We want a fuller experience as we interact with healthcare. Not demanding that healthcare be quicker and easier, but we're demanding more of it as population ages and the boomers begin approaching their 70s. But if we push for quicker and easier health care, we're actually seeing less of our doctors. Medicines are specializing in a primary care. It's no longer really a viable career path. Many between 18 and 25 years of age no longer have a doctor in the sense that we all did and, and many still do. So in the factor of specialization and the to control costs, we will have to fill the gap. Major trends are all pushing health care in the same direction, but they're beginning to cause significant change, which is no small feat in an industry that still takes an oath written 3,000 years ago. There's tech for you. All of us get more into the details of that change, but for the moment, I'll just note that significant change is good for software CEOs in this market. Change upsets the natural order and requires large buyers to do things they aren't very good at, like react quickly and adapt. This requires them to acquire new technology, talent, and to take a share of new markets, requiring agility and requirable strategies. Next up, I'm Gasper. And a healthcare IT entrepreneur involved in that change, as well as a biomedical researcher, and is currently Quorum's vice president and director of research. We're going to hear from him a bit more about how the healthcare IT M&A market is responding to these changes. As you described, those three dimensions of change, regulatory, tech, and social, are creating a growing demand for improved software and services. So urgent, it's powering a classic wave of M&A that continues to crest. Let's cite a single concrete example 
for each of these areas before moving on to examine related deal flow. Just one of those regulatory changes in the U.S., a small part of the major new laws and regulations uh, coming at the industry, uh, is directly influencing providers with incentive payments and escalating penalties, except the switch to electronic records. On the tech side, tablet and mobile for practices and even for reference at point of care is a long-anticipated change that has now arrived. And then all the social changes Nat outlined even just the readiness of a population of patients equipped and accustomed to Internet-based communications creates substantial impact. The companies in health IT, both software and services, are there and moving forward. The only way they can consolidating the innovators with those buyers executing successful acquisition strategies being rewarded by market share and market value. A top example is McKesson. I fought serial acquirer in this space, which saw its stock hit a new market high Friday. This success encourages additional acquisitions as the cycle feeds on itself. These related transactions find representatives among many of the sector of M&A that come tracks, but most occur in the vertical sector, where the like value ratios have been relatively stable and high-valued last year in particular. Of course, these vertical applications are ones which address the healthcare industry's core IT needs directly. The most visible and familiar of these is the established market of office and practice management programs. Um, with considerable disconnect there between objective utility and, and adoption of them, since, like most verticals, the, the systems have proven very sticky, and customers tended to get locked in with, with what they already started with. That's broken now, and the door blown wide open by those three furious winds of change, with the most important area of innovation pertinent to A being electronic health and medical records, which go by the acronym CHR. EMR. There are a new generation of features that those can deliver is recognized by the customer base, and a number of established brands have emerged with early leadership, uh, but plenty of problematic legacy installations uh, uh, and fields remain. This will allow challenges and force M&A of better products from smaller companies. As you know, these are often from vendors who stood the test of time by applying superior technical skills, or domain expertise, and, and always entrepreneurial hustle, uh, instead of spending marketing budgets or acquiring installed base through an A and then mandating transitions. This is clearly the point in the cycle for those remaining to get viewed by buyers as essential to their struggle with peers. Find a gem of a product and an execution team with deep knowledge of the extraordinarily detailed texture of and special sub-markets, that will be key, whether a buyer intends to augment or displace its current flagship. The win in this vertical subsector is very much, then, about electronic records, for reasons related to all three of our trends. It's particularly interesting and informative during the last few months. We cataloged a number of transactions. Among them, we care technologies which carved a niche for itself, mapping special clinical needs into electronic form, the six of which transported founder Kathy Hess and her team into PAC net health systems. Others have quietly developed sophisticated means to more generally address many specialties. Instead of one, uh, only now winning market awareness. This is not solely a U.S. phenomenon. Uh, Here's Advanced Computer Software Group picking up little strand technology in a small but significant U.K. transaction at 2x revenues. Unusual case to see the value disclosed and should be seen in context. Higher value strategic deals are likely to be disclosed, particularly when other factors such as the variety of types of recurring revenues, including the levels of SaaS, uh, are involved. As a general trend, all software companies command higher multiples if they can demonstrate business model robustness with users that stick and efficient marketing and operations. Uh, there's less risk to the acquirer. The examples selected from October shows continue to pop up at a vig vigorous level. Among these, McKesson's leadership and that point-click care addresses long-term care, 
uh, some markets starting to see impact from regulation of, of referring hospitals readmittance tracking, and that M to M machine communication matters are involved in Equitech, an interesting example of how far the clinical record extends as the tech trend towards pervasive connected devices continues. Plus, now mobile patient monitoring devices must also deal with the, the binty nature of cellular and other networks. And the HR EMR consolidation uh, wave it continued to roll on last month. But I think you get the idea. So let's look at examples of some other vertical specialties, which acted PEs such as Blackstone Group, who MDON acquired TC3 Health, a provider of cost containment solutions. The addition of TC3 solutions to MDON's payment integrity solutions will help the healthcare payers control costs by paying only valid claims. Healthcare IT properties also attracted giants like Roper Industries, which made a major move in the medical direction just a few months ago by taking lab info outfit SunQuest off other PE hands for a billion four. Further than the vertical markets at that time, active acquirer M-Modal added a speech recognition company, medical description being a compelling vertical that speech rec leaders like Nuance have also targeted in a couple deals lately include paying $200 million for Quadramed's Quantum Sub. Speaking of Quadramed, earlier this year, it furnished an example of our social trend when it bought the healthcare solutions aspects of NTR. Those patients to check in at medical facilities via asks and both electronically, uh, meeting the increasing demand for patients to control and self-direct their healthcare experience at medical facilities. Social trend trend example, we're to the horizontal markets, whose components generally command even higher multiples, partly to the prevalence of pure SaaS models there. That's more the context in which Francisco Partners portfolio company API Healthcare acquired Concero, a company that provides medical employee scheduling earlier this year. The acquisition enables API to accelerate the path to SaaS for workforce management technology. On the other scale, the valuations we generally see for the IT services companies because um, they don't scale as well due to inherent variable costs for personnel. Those costs and the risks of building management structure for it tend to make these companies less liquid, too, unless they achieve a larger size. Uh, we saw an example of that at a recent healthcare deal months ago this space when SAIC closed Max IT Healthcare, the largest private independent healthcare IT consulting company in North America, for close to half a billion dollars. Our sector, with just a few healthcare deals, is the consumer market. And valuations there have been more variable, although that hasn't stopped transactions from occurring. It sure didn't stop Health Tap from owning Avo's health business. This whole health platform Form will increase Health Tap's medical expert network and bring those users, consumers, immediate access to U.S. doctors and dentists with free answers to their health questions from the convenience of their smartphones and tablets. An example of a consumer sector acquisition occurred last month when Healthiest U, which provides a subscription based online health assessment and improvement service, both now MD, an online healthcare services provider enables consumers to schedule doctor consultations as well as upload and manage personal medical information. Now, HealthU can now integrate and interact with electronic medical records, personal health records, and labs um, to incorporate prescriptions, test results, office visits, all into a patient's pro program. Again, put a consumer in a proactive role. So we've come full circle back to electronic records, but from the consumer side. With ordinary people, the customer, and so the medical industry. That theme cut our final deal. The acronym of Cure Together, which provides an online community for users to share and rate treatment for medical conditions, and grew most millions of ratings after winning the Mayo Clinic Prize for Ideas that will transform healthcare. Cure Together was bought by another innovator, 23 and Me, whose personal genome test kit was named Invention of the Year by Time Magazine. Its database holds hundreds of thousands of results from those kits, 
which tell nearly a million DNA variants and help people understand their meaning and connect with others. Clearly, the smart money sees something big coming in the consumer healthcare sector, previously backed by Google and investors with over $50 million last week, 23, closed another $50 million in a round led by the highly successful Russian billionaire investor Yuri Milner. Now, part of money for was to lower the price for their gene test. Out originally at $999 each a few years ago, it's now just $99. You going to get one or wait till they're cheap? Nine dollars, Elon. Well, thanks for the tip. I've been wondering what to get you for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that price I'll get you too. Um, but actually, on that note, wasn't there another gene testing deal announced last, last week? I'm probably thinking of Amgen uh, buying Deco Genetics, which uh, a company that what they did, they matched its medical tests with Icelandic genealogy data to trace diseases and help target treatments. I was just there two months ago. It's a beautiful country. Uh, back on topic, let's hear from our panel. Thanks for those comments, Elon. Very insightful, very interesting. You bet. Uh, our phase here in this, in this program is to really dig in and, and to better understand the healthcare market. And to do that, ideally, we would have an entrepreneur who's built successful companies in the market. We would have an investor who's placing bets on companies in the market. We would have a visionary who's able to look into the future and imagine how things could be as technology evolves all around us, and then to remind ourselves of the full purpose of healthcare and why it matters in this world would bring in a passionate doctor who's out changing the standard of care for impoverished people throughout the world. Well, that is exactly what we have done today. And I'd like to start our panel session with McCarthy, who went to college here in Seattle. Uh, very pleased to have you on the Call you. That's just one of the reasons. May Facts, which is a pharmacy automation company, grew over a period of years and then sold it. And she's been involved in a number of startups. She has great insight into the industry. And she also came out of some more traditional, uh, I say traditional, non healthcare roles with companies like Boeing. Uh, with that, May, I'd like to welcome you and ask you for your thoughts on the healthcare market. Thank you very much. Uh, my my background for the last couple of companies that I've owned have been primarily serving the hospital inpatient pharmacy world. And so a lot of those healthcare IT companies that have shown up on the screen here in this presentation are companies that we interface with. Um, it seems to me that hospitals are looking for ways to improve healthcare, of course, but they're also looking at ways to decrease costs. So that's been our focus. Um, with this company, Facts, as well as the last one that I started called um, Callus, and that's still in existence. But our goal was to help hospital market reduce their costs primarily. And there are some challenges in regulatory issues across the country that some states, because of board pharmacy regulations, would allow for unit use distribution model and other boards of pharmacies in other states would not. So there's a lot of regulatory assistance that we could sure use. Um, hopefully with Obamacare, it will encourage uh, there to be some sort of a national standard so that hospitals can take advantage of the technology and being able to reduce costs. Our alignment with Tierfshin, a couple of times I've worked with their Pixis group on deals, and they were spent from Cardinal Health. They, Cardinal Health did not have a strategy to do any investment in, in their technology. What they did was instead was return dividends to shareholders. So Fusion spun off a few years ago from Cardinal Health and took all of the medical device uh, projects with them and has been on an acquisition track recently um, that's been amazing. What they're trying to do is um, a portfolio of products when they go not only domestically here in the United States, but also across the world with sorts of different healthcare solutions to decompensate, reduce costs, and improve patient safety. So their position of us was a perfect, perfect um, 
solution. We reside within the inpatient pharmacy, and all of their products reside outside of the inpatient pharmacy. We were able to interface with them and really help dry down inventory within a hospital that could buy air, um, which of course is a waste of money, and then also to improve the agility of medications, the correct medications being given to the patients at the bedside. So the electronic medical records being the focal point for healthcare right now, our products ended up enabling the barcode scanning at the bedside to be done and to be done effectively. So I think what we're going to see is more niche products like ours that come in um, focus on patient safety, do fo focus on reducing costs because hospitals have to do that. And then larger companies like McKesson, who we compete with, uh, Fusion, uh, Health, Marisource Bergen, all picking up these small companies to make their portfolio much more robust. Other specific questions? <laughs> no, that's that's a great summary. And actually, we're already seeing um, we are uh, accepting questions through the chat window, Q and A window. And uh, during your discussion, we had a uh, um, a come in, which I'm actually going to hold May, and I will I will post to you when we reach the end of our our list. But thank you for, for those comments and congratulations on the transaction with okay. Care Fusion. Uh, our panelist, Kevin, the managing director at Bluff Point Associates, and Kevin has an interesting background. He uh, spent years as a an executive in companies helping move their strategy forward. Now uh, on the other side of the fence, in a, in a property role, uh, plants and and working in the healthcare sector. Uh, Kevin, what is your view on the healthcare market from the perspective of an investor? Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, you know, interesting. I think from a, a private equity or investor perspective, I think first you have to look at there's some macroeconomic um, items that are moving some investments around first. There's over $400 billion in uninvested PE funds um, out there. So what that means is you have a lot of pressure from PE and venture capitalists to start utilizing capital and show a return to the limited partners. Uh, so that that is starting to kick in the activity for uh, many PE and venture capital funds as well. Um, I think what we're also seeing is uh, the private equity firms, not only are they trying to make new investments, uh, they're also aggressively pursuing add-on or tuck-in acquisitions, as actually we've seen and you've, you've mentioned. Uh, there's examples down below that I give. Uh, and I think existing PE firms are also making first-time investments in healthcare IT. Uh, so you're starting to see uh, funds that have been around, PE that have been around, starting to see the opportunity in healthcare IT and starting to make these investments. Obviously, Mediware just being acquired by a private equity company. Frankly, Bluff Point Associates, when they hired me in 2011, we were only focused in the financial services market, and now we're starting to focus in healthcare IT because obviously our our partners in in this fund specifically all the opportunity in healthcare IT. Going slide, uh, as you also look at corporate activity in healthcare, um, again from a macro perspective, you're seeing a lot of corporate. The U.S. corporations have generated over two trillion dollars on their balance sheets today. Uh, they have a lot of capital, and they're seeing a slowdown in the global economy, and so they're forced to pursue other growth opportunities, and specifically M&A. So now, specifically into healthcare companies and corporations, they're requiring to broaden and deepen the platform and client relationships. And again, we've seen some of these examples in this presentation, and with some below. I was here Fusion, in fact, so that was an acquisition of deepening those client relationships. Another that was also mentioned is you're getting non-traditional entrants into healthcare IT. That means they are trying to enter this new market. Interesting thing is when they enter these markets, they haven't been in healthcare before. Typically, when they do that, they have to pay a premium valuation to do that because they're looking for product, they're looking for people, they're looking for domain expertise. Examples of those, or several examples, is the ADP acquisition of Advanced MD, Heration with CareFX, and I mentioned earlier Roper. Uh, acquiring SunQuest. Yeah. The talks about change creates opportunity. And you actually mentioned this. 
This is what is driving so much of the activity on the investing in PE and venture capital world. You have the baby boomers from a from a demographics perspective. You have health costs rising that not maintain maintain those level costs. You have industry changes. This is an incredible opportunity for CEOs, entrepreneurs, but also investors to back newly funded, newly created companies. My slide in my final comments. You know, invest. And looking at these demographics and the changes, we do not see any letdown in healthcare acti- activity or trends. We met the regulatory environment, the demographics we will keep the healthcare M and A investments at a robust pace. And you know what we're seeing in the marketplace is many entrepreneurs are so optimistic about the future of healthcare IT. Instead of trying to outright sell their company, they're just looking for additional investments so they can accelerate their business model because they see the opportunity ahead of them. The make is, and, and again, this has been mentioned, but healthcare IT companies are growing faster than other vertical markets and are receiving higher valuations and more interest from PEs and VCs. Uh, we showed the multiples before, but it's almost three times revenue. It's higher than many other, if not all, vertical markets. And so that's why you're getting more interest in these markets and you're getting higher valuations. Those are the trends that I see now. Oh, that's great, Kevin, and, and that reflects what we're seeing as well. If, if you look at our historical deals in healthcare, it was largely consolidating traditional sectors like medical imaging, practice management, uh, staffing, and those are all important core areas, but they're mature. And what we're seeing now are, are some new technologies coming and, and, and changing. Maybe not even new technologies, but technologies that hadn't been sufficiently deployed in healthcare yet, uh, changing delivery and outcome. Comes. And that's exciting for us. That's exciting, obviously, for entrepreneurs who are building value. And um, we'll, we'll be talking some more about that. Kevin, we have some questions for you as well, but we're going to hold those for the moment. And we're going to go next to Reese Jones. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you, Reese. It's really, it's been, we appreciate your time on a couple of these uh, prior events that we've held. And uh, for most of us, being constrained as we are, by assumptions and the and the experience uh, that uh, we live in, and being able to kind of break those chains and imagine how things could be, uh, it, it's it's always interesting to get your perspective, and especially when we're dealing with healthcare. Uh, I made some comments on our annual uh, at the 2012 that we thought were were exciting, and uh, so it's, it's it's good to have you on thinking specifically about healthcare and the future of, of healthcare. The, the uh... Um, one that uh, surprised at this year's uh, Consumer Electronics Show. This, this is the first year where DNA sequencers were uh, shown at the D- Consumer Electronics Show as a, a, perhaps a consumer product someday. But uh, I'll uh, sort of look at this from a 100-year type perspective. And this were just over 100 years since uh, um, what turned out to be DNA was isolated. And about 50 years ago this year, the Nobel Prize was awarded for discovering the structure of DNA, and we're about 15 years since the uh, Human Genome Project was started, uh, and five years since it was completed, and that was a project $3 billion to sequence the first whole human genome, and uh, the cost of that has come down so fast, it's now a few thousand dollars to do it. Um, and we're years into the Human Microbiome Project, which is not just sequencing the DNA of uh, of our own cells, but the DNA of all the cells in us and on us of what we eat and so forth, and then proteomics projects that uh, measure all the chemicals in our body, which uh, are, are closely related to health in the moment. So the in general, DNA is the code of life, and we've uh, uh, first been figuring out how it works and then the ability to read it. And now um, uh, multiple companies are working on the ability to edit it and write it uh, for gene therapy and, and synthetic life. And, uh, and two years ago, the uh, first uh, uh, synthetic uh, uh, genomes were built up in a cell, uh, meaning a uh, life created from code that's out in a computer and chemicals that turn into reproducing life. And that was uh, Craig Dentner announced two years ago. 
and the pace of this has been accelerating very rapidly uh, since then um, in that the most people are familiar with Moore's Law, which is doubles the semiconductors on a chip every year and a half. Well, the ability to read and write DNA is accelerating at, at least five times Moore's Law, meaning twice as good several times a year. And the uh, amount of data uh, or big data that's coming from this is exceeding the ability of computers and databases to store it and the ability of internet to move it around. And it turns out the amount of data, the trillions of cells in a person, the amount of data in each of those cells uh, exceeds uh, the uh, more or less the amount of websites on the internet. And the concept of big data as it starts to um, describe the uh, individual uh, uh, data in a person, and of course the health of main, many populations is extremely big data. Uh, needing uh, uh, computers and artificial intelligence and so forth to keep track of it. And so uh, the, this is the code of life trends I'll do, do for a second is big data. Uh, um, and the uh, medical literature and the uh, data coming from patients and the data coming from normals has already very quickly uh, exceeded the ability of any human to keep track or keep up the data of it all. So the interaction of computers to the Internet to do this is, is essential. The, um, uh, to mention imaging and so on. But the uh, uh, other major trend, of course, is the Internet. Uh, going from a billion people to perhaps uh, uh, three to five billion people over the next, next uh, few years, mostly matched by phones. Phones can be looked at as not just a phone, but can also be looked at as a uh, as a health sensor that you wear on your body that uh, can listen to and can uh, take pictures of your uh, health conditions and can monitor your movement and activity and also give you access to objective health data without just directly from the data in the Internet without necessarily having to uh, trouble uh, uh, the normal healthcare system. And um, that brings me to the fourth point, which is health management, in that to scale to be able to uh, take care of the health of 7 billion people, uh, the use of technology is essential in that there are the normal medical uh, model that we have won't scale to that kind of scale, uh, um, and we need the help of, uh, of new technologies to do that. Many new companies have been started to work on this. Uh, um, the you know the ability to read and write DNA, uh, the stem cell uh, therapies, and and programming of these stem cells and synthetic biology and gene therapies, uh, replacing genes that are missing has just been uh, approved in Europe. Um, and the uh, self-help um, being something that you take care of your health yourself, and that's something that can scale to a phone and every person on the planet. And the Enterprise has a uh, uh, contest to uh, for the first uh, phone uh, application that is able to do better diagnosing um, uh, disease in a person than, and then a panel of, of human doctors. So the, uh, these are things that can scale uh, and are major business opportunities, uh, use technology to address health needs, and are not necessarily following traditional uh, uh, models that uh, didn't have access to these types of technologies, uh, such as DNA laser printers or, or uh, um, uh, big data um, artificial intelligence that can deal with the massive amount of information that uh, us humans can't. So that, that's where I'll uh, stop there. Uh, it's a really interesting, Reese. And your background with Natopia and, and Farallon and some of the other businesses that you had uh, had you dealing directly with the, the impact and power of, of the Internet and the network. And it's interesting to hear you now bridging that vision with what's happening at a, at a cellular level. And I, some of this self-help, to me the most exciting part of this whole self-help area is is what we might call, you know, the Western diseases. There, there's a really cool company here in, in Seattle called Every Move. Uh, they share the premise that you have a sensor on you all the time and you're surrounded by data collection. And you actually make healthy choices and walk up the stairs and go to the gym and so on. 
you'll get rewarded. It's like getting frequent flyer points, uh, and that can have a huge impact where we don't need the health care. So I think a billion patients who uh, sell enough Coca-Cola to fund treatment globally for the diabetes that would result to get a bit uh, <laughs> controversial here. Sorry, Ilana. Oh, no, I'll, yeah. I'll go back to the program yeah. regularly. We can't provide them water. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then vitamin water is not the answer either. But, um, okay. Uh, Reese, we have a couple of questions that we'd like to address your way, but before we do that, uh, our final speaker, Doc Deedson, uh he's on an airplane right now, so he couldn't join us live, but he was kind enough to record his thoughts. Fascinating guy. He's been in India working with Mother Teresa. He's been in a dozen, more than a dozen countries around the world. He has really dedicated himself to making a difference uh, globally and, and, and uh of his perspective on the power of, of medicine in the world. So let's go now to Chuck. I has covered in my consultation work and doing Lean Six Sigma consulting, management consulting among both inpatient and outpatient settings that clinicians are typically held up by templates or the screens that they're looking at. I've seen a lot of frustration and a lot of need for physicians as well as nurses, therapists, uh, pharmacists, psychologists to be trained over over and over again, we see a drop off in productivity. In a couple of instances, I've seen physicians' productivity drop off as much 50 or 60 percent, even one year into a transition from paper charts to software. So that's certainly not, not what we want to see. It, there's enough paperwork already. Now that we're going to software, I would like to see that simplify the the process of the documentation. I have done work in multiple countries uh, serving underserved populations, 20 different countries approximately over the past 20 years, uh, working in the former Soviet Union and then uh, ultimately even in the Middle East, talking with um, United Nations Relief and Works Agencies in the Palestinian refugee camps where obviously electronic medical records would be an important part of how do you maintain records on a population that that moves about. Ultimately, it's going to be very important going forward that we are not only looking at the health of the individual, but the the health of the population. It seems clear to me that base systems are ideal for that. Um, what we typically see happening is, again, they've stuck in old mindsets that healthcare systems are very regional, and they think of competition as being within their own cities or their own states depending upon how advanced they are in trauma support or other types of tertiary care. But the truth is, all this is becoming known worldwide. In fact, phone applications work better in Haiti in some parts of Indiana. So the of this is downloading apps on the iPhone or the iPad, going into remote locations, gathering pertinent information on individual patients and being able to package it in such a way that we can get input from physicians in location in other countries. My good friend who is a, an IT specialist, he is a developer, he likened it to uh, seeing where the Flintstones meet the Jetsons. He was surprised by the amount of technology we had when it came to treating the patients, doing the clinical diagnostic type of workups, the MRIs, the echocardiograms, all of the details that could be seen, how all of that was actually being captured. On the other hand, what he was seeing being documented and how that information was being transmitted to the referring physicians was rather primitive. So we're finally, at this point, getting our documentation to catch up with our diagnostics and our therapeutic tools. Yeah, interesting comments from Chuck. Um, go back to our panelists with some questions that have come up during the presentation. And uh, May, I'm going to start with you. Uh, just looking at your, I'm, I'm going to decode the question a little bit, but looking at your history and working in supply chain and barcode and at, at company Boeing, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's this theme of what's, what's old is new again. Were, were you able to take some of the best practices from traditional industry and a healthcare, was that the genesis of your success here, or were there some other elements at work? A lot of elements at work. <laughs> we did, um, with, did with the last 
two companies, which were in healthcare, and that's Talist and Fax, is we took a drug distribution model incorporated by Cardinal Health, Marisource Bergen, McKesson, and the other secondary drug suppliers. And we looked at how they moved drugs from their warehouses to their customer sites. So what we decided to do was take a supply chain model, put in a hospital pharmacy to enable the audit delivery of medications to the patient care areas. The patient care areas include uh, dispensing cabinets, Fixus, Omnicell, McKesson, Mercer-Spurgen. also includes patient-specific orders that would come from Epic, Cerner, or any of the other hospital information systems. So that, that those were the customers, and the drugs were located in the pharmacy. The challenge with hospitals is that you don't have a one-to-one -one relationship. And it's one of the reasons why a company like ours could come in and a company like, um, oh gosh, uh, Telesis or, um, oh gosh, um, uh, some material handling, inventory management systems couldn't come into our marketplace because they didn't understand the many to one relationship. Take us in all of the pharmacy information systems, order their medications in med, med IDs. So you have a med ID that means acetaminophen but you have 10 different suppliers, including generics. So being able to translate that ID to an actual product, getting the substitutions that will come in from the suppliers when out of stock on the co contract item, those are all real, real big challenges which are not prevalent in material handling. Material handling generally has a one-to-one -one relationship. So when... We came into the marketplace in June 2. We decided that we wanted to automate the distributive medications to patient care areas within a single hospital, and that limited us to a certain size of hospital. Well, with SACS, we went one step further and decided to take hospital systems like the Cleveland Clinic. Um, MD Anderson, Memorial Hermann, HCA, multiple hospitals that are within a system and turn them into their own unit of use distribution network. What it means is a larger facility will open a package of 12 vials and distribute in full units of use to either other commonly owned facilities. What that is is take someone like MD Anderson with a $350 million annual drug budget and the 4% that they're throwing away every single year because drugs expire, that now eliminates the grand majority of that. So there's a lot of waste in healthcare that's going on and a lot of niche companies that will have a wonderful, wonderful time in this space just eliminating waste. So do the same giant pieces of material handling equipment like carousels and conveys and things like that. Yes, we do. But the key, um, the key success was the software that we wrote in both of those companies. Uh, the software enabled this to be a very, very simple system, enabled the cost of goods sold to be tracked throughout the whole organization as the product moves through the organization. It had an audit trail. So because with medications, you do want to know lot numbers, expiration dates, and things like that as it moves through your organization. So lots and lots and lots of um, lot detailed software work for this particular space, but the same old technology, uh, carousels that have been around since the 1940s are still being used in our model. Yeah, I think I can hear Kevin really nodding his head because that's a great uh, OI argument, um, mitigating waste, increasing efficiency. And then you also mentioned that some more consistent uh, regulatory changes, that'll create an opportunity to scale up and, and, and do what you're doing on a grand scale. So that, that's exciting. Right. Uh, in California, it just changed. Um, the unit of use distribution model just got approved. And you'd think that 
California would be one of the cheerleaders for this model, but every single state has its own um, its own uh, regulatory board that will enable this kind of uh, wide distribution network to exist. Yeah, interesting. So it'll, it'll it, it means even if it doesn't, there's there's still opportunity for entrepreneurs. I, I'd, I'd like to a question now to to, to you, Kevin. Uh, you talked about some of the trends that you're seeing, the amount of money that needs to, to be put to the fact that there's disruption, the fact that there's deals. Um, do you think, as an investor, with all the change, with all the disruption, with all the uncertainty around regulation, with the uncertainty around the economy, how do you guys even place a single bet? What, what, what's your criteria for for being in a business? Are you looking for uh, some May who really understands an existing paradigm and can come in and save people money? Are you looking for the next big thing that's going to fund change how health care is delivered? I think it, excuse me, it varies. I think certainly we have to understand the market the opportunity plays in, um, you know, what type of opportunity there is, uh, what is the competition in that area. Um, and then you have to look at some understanding of financial metrics of, you know, we're more of a private equity investor, so we look for um, existing businesses that n- we need to fuel for growth. Uh, we don't do early stage things that we don't understand that there may or may not be a market there going forward. So then to some fundamentals and understand you know, what has been their historical revenue growth and what type of profitability projections could they have. And, and technology does that, set them apart. So look at essentially each deal that comes in and understand that business, what is the opportunity, what is the threat, and their investment decisions off of those criteria. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. Well, I'd, I'd like to address the last question that we have time for today to Reese. And this goes back to the kind of the divide between looking at things on a cellular level and looking at things on a macro internet level. You mentioned that there's basically enough data storage and computing power available in the world to map individual and we have a billion people in the world, but is the point where we have the, 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 the storage capacity and the processing power to map 7 billion people, and when we do that, we're going to be looking at this from a different perspective. In other words, we, we don't study ants, typically. We study anthills, not a great analogy for the human race, but, um, but, but what your thoughts on that as we, as we begin to, to look at things holistically? Well, fortunately, the ability of the Internet to move data and the ability of computers to store it and process it is also exponentially increasing. So the ability to store data is, uh, is, is catching up with the amount of data that is able to be collected. But the, uh, the sort of fundamental science of it is that just because there's data doesn't mean it means anything. And at the most fundamental level for a person they're healthier or they're not healthy, and that's one bit of data. And so, you know, the uh, molecular structure of their pancreas isn't necessarily uh, a useful piece of data to be stored unless that's where there's an issue. So some of the uh, health records and so forth is looking for, like 23andMe does, just some of the data that makes up a person and which of it is out of uh, out of line with uh, the norm or the norm of the population. And so uh, what just collect raw data is not so much the issue. It's more looking at for the data that is useful in in affecting the health of a person. And this changes uh, over people's lives, and it changes based on what you eat for lunch, and, and it changes based on what you've just been infected with. And so the types of things... Uh, um, the data science problem as to well what is useful in in helping the health of people and and what is not it's not just purely a matter of of collecting massive amounts of data even though the technical capability is is there to do that now yeah it's, it's interesting it, the, the other analogy there would just be worse figuring out security for uh, enterprise networks the insight was we can't do everything, but let's look for the anomalies. And what do we learn from those? Yes, and it reports the same. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, we're at the end of our time. I really, again, appreciate uh, our panelists taking time with us today. Uh, by the way, uh, May will be at the January 30th World Symposiums Conference in Seattle. This uh, event's in place for seven or eight years now in New York, London, San Francisco. This is the second time in Seattle, and it, it brings in about 120 local CEOs, entrepreneurs, uh, VCs, really doing of tech and, and finance. And May, we're, we're very happy to have you uh, as part of that program. Log the World Financial Symposium site for more information on that. And that brings us to the end of our time today. Thank you again to our panelists. The program will be available on the on web uh, in a week. And if you have further questions or want further discussion with us or any of the panelists, uh, please out through the email you used to register. Thank you.